take it to be um, emotional dispositions. Revival is beyond your emotion. When the power of God is upon you, it's going to impact on your emotion. But these things are beyond emotions. Because these are power and forces of the spirit that makes for kingdom advancement. Your emotion cannot have so much authority in that realm. You need something that is tangible. Tangible enough for demons to be scared by their presence. Tangible enough to be able to advance policies and purposes in the spirit. Glory to Jesus. So it's important for us to know the markers of revival so that we can know how to press in the spirit to provoke them. Because revivers are provoked. Revivers are provoked. When you study your scriptures, you're going to find it. Most times when revival happens, there are people, human agents, that provoke them. But you will not even know when revival is happening if you don't know the marks of revival. So it's important for us to know the marks of revival, then we know how to provoke revival. And as we begin to provoke revival in packets of pe amongst packets of people from family to family, there will be a quorum created that will make it affect the nation. Praise God. You know, it began from the upper room, but it affected the whole territory. So sometimes when God wants to start the revival, it won't begin in the stadium. It can begin among three friends. It can begin in the family. And then it becomes three families. It becomes five families, ten families, twenty families. Before you know it becomes Canberra. Then he enters Sydney. Then he enters Brisbane. Then he enters glory to God. And then Australia will be on fire for God. <laughs> glory to Jesus. But there are marks. There are marks of every true revival. And I want us to take time to write these things down. So that we, we are mindful of them and then we know what we are pressing for. I give you five of them very quickly tonight because I also want to show you how to provoke revival, how to trigger revival. The first mark of revival is true conviction and genuine salvation of souls. Whatever is happening, if it does not translate to conviction in the heart, if it does not translate to salvation of souls, it's not yet a revival. It becomes a revival when people are convicted of sins and when people return to the Lord and receive salvation. That's when you know a revival has started. Acts chapter 2 verse 37 and 41. The Bible said when Peter was done preaching, he said they were pricked in their hearts. They were not excited by what he shared. It can excite you and it should excite you if you are a Christian. But if you are in the world, it will first of all cut you in the heart before it excites you. He said they were pricked in their hearts and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? So this is a conviction that leads people to salvation. It's not a conviction that makes people feel guilty. It's not a conviction that makes people feel bad about themselves. It's a conviction that wants to draw people to God so that they can receive of the life of God. What shall we do to be saved? And Peter told them immediately, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and you shall be saved. And he told them that times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And immediately, the Bible makes us understand in Acts 2.41 that that very day, 3,000 was added to the church. Revival has begun. When revival happens, there is conviction. Anything we are doing that does not affect the hearts of people but their mind only is not revival. That's why I told you it's not emotion. It's not emotion. It must travel deep enough to touch the hearts of people. And when it touches people's heart, there must be conviction that leads to salvation. And if you read the scriptures, you're going to see that every time they stepped out, the number kept increasing. The number kept increasing. In Acts 13, verse 43 and 44, the Bible told us, Paul and Barnabas went out and preached. And the Bible said that day, it said the whole city came to listen to them. The whole city. And they were convicted and they repented and they gave their hearts to Christ. That is revival. There's no revival that does not include massive salvation of souls. If souls are not being saved, then we are just exciting ourselves. If it is a revival, souls will be saved. And let me tell you something. It can begin from a group. Eventually, individuals will step out. And these individuals, a point will come when they can win cities. In Acts chapter 8 verse 5, those who were deacons in church, their job was like the ushers you see here. They were just ushering people to church. They were not apostles and prophets. They were just ushering people to church. Sit here, sit there. But revival came. 
When revival comes, everybody becomes a soul winner. When revival comes, a tree becomes a forest. When revival comes, everybody must become fruitful. You can't say revival is happening and you are comfortably sitting in church and you are not going out. The force of revival will push you out to evangelize. The force of revival will push you out to witness to people. That's why people forget about all of the two. The emotion is too much and it's not backed up with action. Somebody tells you he's on fire for God and for one month he has not won any soul. He's on fire for God and for six months he's not won any soul. You don't know what fire is. What's happening to you is just adrenaline. If fire comes, if fire comes, you will see everybody as a potential soul in the kingdom of God. It will move you. Imagine what happened. Philip was running on account of persecution. But when he entered Samaria, it became, a, it became an opportunity for soul winning. And the Bible said in verse 5, he preached Christ there. And he said the whole city was filled with joy. The whole city was filled. One man began to take cities. And that became the testimony of the apostles. Most of them traveled down to Antioch. And the moment they got there, they started winning souls. Listen, you may have come to Australia to get a job. But when revival hits you, you'll be shocked. That you will become a soul winner in Australia before you are a worker for the government. If you don't know revival, you will not know soul winning. But the moment you know soul winning, know that you are revived. The second mark of true revival is the move of God's power. When revival comes, revival comes with power. You can't find the people who are revived and you don't see signs and wonders happening amongst them. Everywhere they gather, the spirit of revival will always provoke signs and wonders. Everywhere they gather, the spirit of revival. You know, people don't really train to walk in the miraculous. There is a place for mentoring. But I can tell you that the miraculous is born by the spirit. That force will push you into it. It's as you start walking in that you start learning. It's not something you learn from a Bible school or a lecture room. The power will move you. And when the manifestations begin, then you are taught how to manage it and to grow in it. But you cannot be mechanically brought into power. Look at what happened in Acts of the Apostles. These guys followed Jesus. Jesus sent them out. They cast out devils. They returned. They were excited. And that was it. The next time they attempted, the demon didn't go anywhere. And they asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this devil? He said, because of your own belief. And Jesus went further to tell them that this kind went not but by prayer and fasting and left them there. And there was no record that they did anything again until Jesus left them. Jesus believed so much in the Holy Ghost. He believed so much. You know, when Jesus wanted to leave, they were troubled. Why will you leave us like this? He said, no, I won't leave you as orphans. He said, when I leave you, another comforter will come. And he told them, it's better for you that I go. Because if I do not go, the Holy Ghost will not come. Because when I'm with you, all of you surround me. But when the Holy Ghost comes, I will be inside all of you. So you will not be limited by me. You will become unlimited because I will be in you and with you forever. What a blessing. Glory to Jesus. He knows how these things work. And so when Jesus left, we saw that these guys that locked themselves behind closed doors, who were afraid, suddenly the fire came upon them and they opened the door and stepped out. They were so afraid that when Jesus came, they couldn't even open the door. Jesus had to come in through the wall because nobody had the temerity to open the door. And Jesus spoke with them and left. They were dead till the next Sunday. Imagine we lock ourselves up here till next Sunday because of fear. Jesus walks in, nothing happened, he left, came back next Sunday and they were still arguing about Thomas's doubt. And they came, okay, since argument is the, the subject matter, look at my hands, do you believe now? And Jesus still left, they were still locked up. You assume that they've seen Jesus twice, resurrected, they should have boldness. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. They saw him, they locked themselves. But the moment the Holy Ghost came, the Bible said they opened the door and they stepped out. And the day they opened the door was the day they should have been afraid the most. Because the Pentecost celebration was ongoing. But they walked into the people and began to preach. And they preached with boldness. Souls were saved. No miracles. And then Acts chapter 3, the Bible said at the hour of prayer, 
He said, Peter and John were coming into the temple to pray. And he said, at the temple called Beautiful, they brought a man that was impotent in his feet. And they brought him there from when he was a child. And he asked for arms on daily basis. And he looked at them in Acts 3 verse 6 and asked them for arms, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have. Who told him that he had something? There is an education that revival brings you. See, there is a knowing, there is an awareness that revival brings to you. That thing that you saw somebody doing in a stadium, suddenly you realize that you also carry it. That thing that you read in the Bible that Paul did, that thing you read in the Bible that Peter did, suddenly you will just realize that I carry the same spirit. I carry the same dimension. He says, silver and gold have I known. He said, but such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. You will think the man will jump up. And when he finished talking, the guy sat down. If you were the one, you will assume, oh, his faith should have gone down. The Bible said he stretched his hand. I gave you a commandment. You are supposed to walk, not to sit. And he pulled him up. The Bible said when he pulled him up, he said strength entered his ankle. See, that spirit is the one that works the manifestation. Strength entered his ankle. And suddenly the man leaped up. He jumped all of a sudden and began running and praising God. And from that day, the gate of the miraculous opened. Acts chapter 5 verse 12. The scale went higher. And see what the Bible said. It started scaling up. You know, it began with one man. But now, it's going into multitudes. It said, by the hands of the apostles. It said, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's part. Next verse. You will see what happened. The transition that took place in Peter's ministry. And it said, and of the rest, does no man join himself with them. But the people magnified them. They, they were just looking at these guys every day and they wondered the dimensions of God that flowed out of them. They became a, a, a symbol of wonder to the people. They magnified them. What is happening to these guys? When did they move from fishermen to wise men? When did they move from wise men to miracle workers? That's the spirit of revival at work. Listen, some of you will leave this conference and people will know you a second time. They will wonder, when did she stop being that timid young lady to this vocal lady that talks and demons scream out of people? When, when did this transition happen? When, when, did this, when did she become so bold? When, when did she migrate? Is revival walking out a protocol through you? It's revival. In verse 14, the Bible said, And the believers were more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and women verse 15 is my emphasis and he said in so much that they brought forth the sick into the street suddenly they were now importing sick people you are in the hospital they say your case is is there's no hope they say no there's hope we know somewhere there's a place where hopeless situations are turned around and there was no room in the temple. They went into the temple to pray. If you need healing, wait there. There are those who carry healing buffet. They will approach you shortly. Can you imagine? And the Bible said they kept them on the streets. And they laid them in beds. And in, on crouches. That at least the shadow of Peter. So when this man came out from the place of prayer. If he's walking this way, people are aligning themselves where the shadow is. If it turns, they are aligning. There was no need saying in the name of Jesus, rise up. There was no need holding them to pull them up anymore. The shadow carried sufficient weight of glory. See, when revival begins to happen, the power begins to grow. The intensity of the manifestation begins to grow. And you will discover that the miraculous will become a byproduct. At this point, it looked as if it was a prerogative of the apostles. Then you go to Acts chapter 8. Ushers too discover that oh, what is happening here is not for apostles, it's for every one of us. And the Bible said many signs were done by Philip amongst the people. And he said, when he was sent, he will rush, he went into Samaria on account of persecution. He said in verse 5: first, he preached Christ, the city was filled with joy. 
Then number two, the Bible said, from verse six, he said, when the people saw, he said, the people gave heed in one accord unto the things which Philip said, spake, hearing and what? Seeing the miracles which Philip did. When revival comes, they don't only talk. People also see the manifestations of God. Hearing and seeing the miracles which this guy did. What were the miracles? Verse 7. He said, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of not few, many that were possessed with them. He said, and many taken with palsies. That means they were paralyzed. And those who were lame, the Bible said they were all healed. They were all healed. This is why the whole city submitted to the authority of Jesus. When revival begins, the move of God's power becomes natural. We cannot say there's revival in Sydney and every one of us don't demonstrate the power of God. I'm telling you, something is coming upon people in this land. And you will see that in your offices, deaf ears will open, blind eyes will see, tumors will disappear. You don't have to be ordained a prophet. You just have to be one amongst the people. And the same grace will manifest through your life. It's a marker of revival. The move of the supernatural. The move of the miraculous. The move of signs and wonders. It was what characterized the early church. Number three. When revival begins, there is the deployment of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. We are in a very godless generation. The fear of God is no more. People relate with God like their assistants in the office. Wake up from, from the room when you're already going and say, Lord, let today be a good day. <laughs> you, you, are, you are instructing your, your bodyguard. To do what he should do. Oh yeah, precious Lord. Today has to be a great day. And then he goes out. He forgets God. Gives attention to every other thing. And then talks to God like some waiter. Who is standing there waiting to receive instructions. When that kind of thing is happening. Revival has not started. If revival comes. People will tremble at God's presence. People will honor the word of God. People will honor the things of God. Does it not surprise you that every other thing we do, some of us, the regard we have for our bosses and our jobs, we don't have for God. When it has to do with the house of God, we have a thousand and one complaints. When it has to do with the house of God, we have a thousand and one excuses, but never for our jobs. Because we have more regard for the salaries that we get. We have more regard to the status that the job brings us, not the house of God not the things of the spirit if revival begins god will be referenced so much that when the name of the lord is mentioned people will literally quake there will be a consciousness when the word of the lord is is read or preached you will see the response of people there will be regard there will be reverence because it will be so real as though god was standing there with them that's when you know revival has come and when revival starts there are systems that are put in place to make sure the fear of God is moved into the hearts of men. Look at Acts chapter 5. From verse 1 to verse 11. We saw the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Because they saw that Barnabas sold land and brought the proceeds to the apostles' feet and it was celebrated and God's son of consolation. They too wanted that level of recognition. But they didn't have the heart of Barnabas. So they sold their own land hid part of the money and brought a little portion to the apostles. And Peter asked Ananias a question. He said, before you sold this land, was it not yours? And he said, it was his. After you sold it, was it not yours? It was his. Why then the compulsion? Why did you take part of the money, hid it, and came here to make a show as though this was the whole money for which you sold the land? The moment he heard it, he fell down and died. And the Bible said the men took him, went and buried him. Three hours later, the wife came. Sam is still young girl. We didn't know when the service started, but we know that three hours after Ananias died, service was still on. <laughs> if you run service here for three hours, <laughs> I'm sure some people may need coffee. 
and Tom may have to go home. Three hours later, I'm not saying we shouldn't have regard for our time and other things, work, and that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying these guys had capacity to stay with God. Three hours later, Sapphira came in and Peter asked her, How much did you sell for the land for which you brought the proceeds here? And she repeated the same thing the husband said. Peter said, The feet of them that put your husband are by the door, they are coming in to carry you. <laughs> if that one happens now, the Australian police will be nearby. That's why God, God, God uses different approach for different generations. <laughs> And immediately she fell down and died. And the men came, took her, and buried her. Service was still ongoing. I mean, I was amazed when I read those scriptures. Somebody falls down in church, died. They carried the person and buried the affair service. And the people were still there for three hours. Another person died. And the people were still there. The power with which this man preached in the early church, we need those powers now. We need those powers. We need those powers. Look at the church of Paul. He was preaching in Ephesus. Eutychus fell down and died. Paul went, fell upon him. They brought him up. And service continued till morning. Nobody went home. Does it not fascinate? See, what we are doing is becoming a social gathering. Using tricks to keep people instead of power. Instead of an akazo. We are using tricks to bring, to keep people. This was a church that people were compelled by the power of the Spirit. By the power of the Spirit. And the woman fell down and died. And Acts 5 11, the Bible said, And great fear fell upon all the people. Great fear. There was a reverence for the things of God. You know, you can't come to such, a, to such gathering and lie. Because everybody became conscious that God is with us. And this God that is with us, on one side is love, on the other side is judgment. And so there was reverence for God. There was honor for God. This is the... Come from. Just, just trying to coerce people and manipulate people. This is a generation where somebody can come to the altar and he's speaking for two hours. He's trying to pull somebody down. The whole message is tailored delicately to pull somebody's ministry down. And when he finishes, that person's ministry is finished. Instead of the anointing rising in that ministry to uplift and edify people, the, the whole operation is, is hacking somebody down. When he's done talking for two hours, the whole ministry will diminish in two hours. And his job is done. Not because there's anything wrong with that person. It's because he's bitter towards that person. And he's using the altar to advance that purpose. So when we say we need revival, we know what we are saying. The fear of God must return to the church. So that those who call on the name of the Lord must walk with God with reverence, with fear, and with trembling. So that when we stand for God, there will be no compromise as touching our convictions. This is what revival comes to sponsor. There is fear for God amongst the people. And fear for God is not that you are afraid of God's presence. It's that you honor God's presence. It's that you regard God's word. And you regard it in a way that you tremble at his presence. Anything God says, you do it with the whole of your heart. There is passion with your service for God. That is what it means. And it's a revival that you see things like this happen. When revival begins, people can go out of their way to see that kingdom advances. Go and read about the early church. It will humble you. There were people who in a bid to preserve the Bible, their families were burnt. But they saw it as an honor that the Bible should reach the next generation so that they know about the word of God. There were people that were born to the stake because they preached the gospel. They knew that if they preach the gospel in these cities, they will be killed. But they hazarded their lives. Such was the passion with which they ran. And they preached the gospel and they were killed, but they were excited because they knew they brought a witness to that territory. But in our generation today, you invite somebody to preach, 
or a music minister comes to worship, is first of all telling you, my bill is five thousand dollars. We have higher leads, not ministers. Because there's no river. The fear of God is no more. Number four, marker of revival is restoration of righteous living. When revival comes, people begin to live right. Isaiah 1, 26 and 27. Nobody needs to come and give rules and regulations. Everybody will serve God from the heart. The template for righteous living will flow from your heart. The righteousness that was your nature will become your lifestyle. You know, the Bible said, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Romans 5, 17, shall reign in life. That's the nature God gave us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He said, He made him that was without sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So God installed that nature so that we will leave it out. I'm talking to you now because I'm human. So the ability to speak was installed. If I don't speak, it will either be because I'm sick, or because I'm not human. So you can't claim you are righteous and yet you have the righteous nature and you don't leave it out. Revival comes to insist that that righteous nature must be lived out. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 and 10, he said, My little children, let no man deceive you. He said, He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He said, This is how the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil. So the children of God are known by their righteous character. They live righteous. And so when people are revived, you will see that righteousness, they'll be excited about living righteous. Because the power to re live righteous will be released and conferred upon them. So in Isaiah 26, 27, we saw an outpouring that sponsored righteousness as a lifestyle. If you read the stories of revival, those of you who have taken time to read it, you will see how crime rate will go down in the whole city. There were many cities that they had to retire. I read about the, 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 the Welsh Revival. They had to retire police officers because crime rate diminished. No, no, nobody needed to pursue any thief. Everybody on the street repented. I am not a thief anymore. I want to work with my hand because there was an energy in the atmosphere that became a policing force in that territory. So when we, when we spray revival and it comes, you will discover it will become a force that insists on the right thing. You can't come to your office and, and do what and do something that is evil against the people. If you carry that pen to, to do anything that is corrupt, the pen will speak to you. Don't use me for iniquity. <laughs> Even his pen. Don't use me for iniquity. I will not. I will not. <laughs> you will run out of that office. <laughs> Strange things happen during revival. Strange things happen. But at, by all means, righteousness will reign among the people. He said, and I will restore thy judges as at the first, thy counselors as at the beginning. He said, afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. That's a sign that revival has come. Most nations and territories that experience revival, some of them 50 years later, 100 years later, you could still see tokens of righteousness as a proof that once upon a time, God passed through the city. These are the things we cry for. Because if these things don't happen, what will be the testimony of our Christianity? What will be the proof that we came? The proof that we came is not that, oh, we ended up building a church. The proof that we came is not that, oh, we became popular in our generation. All of that means nothing. Let there be a testimony that when we walk through the land, men feared God. The Bible said, from the days of John. So in the spirit realm, there are things that are chronicled against people's names. He said, from the days of John, he said, the kingdom of God was preached. And he said, a man pressed into it. There was something John brought on the scene that made men to press and to see God on their own accord. No wonder the Bible called him a burning and a shining light. The guy didn't even come to the city center. 
he went to the wilderness and even in the wilderness the whole city went there so he relocated the whole city because of the power that he carried from the days of john kingdom became a priority of people people felt they were relevant if they had a place in god's kingdom that's a testimony it's eternal it doesn't die it outlive you when we leave let it be said that in your day in your day from the days of Imabon, from the days of Tinashe, let it be said that in your day, in your day, something happened that became a memorial in the spirit. That's the burden of revivalists. I can't be here and my street, there, there are hallows. I can't be here and there is still tales of kidnapping. I can't be here and there's still story of corruption. You will say, no, it must be erased in your own time. So that in the chronicles of eternity, there will be a testimony that a man showed up and things happened because of his presence. That is true revival. I don't know if it was the Almudi they spoke of now. Forgotten. He enters a city and then the power of God, the anointing is full. No service. He just walks into a city and because he's present, people start having encounters. Anoint, the anointing of God is full. It's not in the service. Oh, touch, touch. No. He just comes with a cloud. And some of the indicators of that cloud is that they say certain habits and addictions die because they pass by. So much so that a city where people were drunks because it passed, the appetite for drunkenness died. No crusade organized. A man just walked through a city. He walked through. That's one who carried the spirit of revival. And so when revival comes to our borders, Righteousness will become our lifestyle. This is why we press and pray and preach revival. Number five, marker of revival is blessings for God's people. Isaiah 32 15 already captures it. The wilderness becomes a fruitful field, the fruitful field becomes the forest. When revival comes, God's people are blessed. They are blessed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 34 and 35. The Bible said those who were possessors of land sold them, brought the money to the apostles' feet. Even distribution was made. He said there was none among them that lacked. When revival begins to happen, there is abundance. Because that spirit does not just come to make you feel that you are on fire. We were sharing earlier and we said when the spirit of God comes upon men, it opens them to different dimensions. Especially that which is consistent with their ordination. The only thing powering this whole facility now is called current. But the current that enters this facility, when it enters different appliances, it becomes different thing. For this microphone, it becomes sound. For these bulbs, it becomes light. For the air conditioners, here is heat. In Africa, it's cold. <laughs> we work on very high temperature, so we need air conditioners for cold. Here you use it for heat. But when it enters, depending on where you are, it becomes cold or heat. But by all means, the electric current is converted. See, that's what the fire does. When the anointing comes upon me as a preacher, it opens me up to the secrets of God. And it opens me up to dimensions of miracle working power. Because for my own meeting, cripples will come, blind will come. But you are a businessman. So when that fire comes upon you, it opens you up to skill for negotiation. It opens you up to wisdom for investment. So when you enter there, you, you, you can carry a thousand dollars and make a hundred thousand dollars. And people ask you, what happened? It's an intelligence. You know what to invest in at a particular time and it will appreciate. It's like you are reading something written on the wall somewhere. It's a wisdom. And therefore, some of you who are people of power, into government governance it will become favor on your life and so that favor will cause even those who hate you to be quiet when they are speaking about you so that by all means you will ascend the ladder of authority and if they want to talk about you god they, they, that that spirit will increase your influence it will increase your influence so much that even when they talk their voice the volume will reduce so when they talk they will ignore them they will not start feeling bad i'm making a point here they say no you are not making a point. Your counsel has been turned to foolishness. Be because of influence. That's what the spirit does. 
And so by the end of the day, every one of us will become powerful in our respective sphere and it will translate to blessedness, blessings and abundance. So when we come together, there's nobody begging the other person, please help me. No, we are just exchanging values. We are just exchanging values. We are just exchanging, exchanging resources and everyone is just doing well. So revival is not a call for poverty. It's actually a call for abundance. That's why it's in the days of revival that kingdom spread the most. You will see two people can come together and say, well, what do you want to do in Fiji Island? I, we need some crusades there. They will drop money. Just get preachers to go. We can't go now. But anybody who is going, we will sponsor it. You know that revival is happening. And then you will see missionaries traveling across different nations. It's from revival. Most of them who came to Africa, they didn't come because they had money. People sponsored them. Because when revival happened, there was a boom. And that boom made resources available that translated to kingdom advancement. So when God is talking revival, he's mindful of your blessing. Because there is so much amplification in the program of God that will need different dimensions of empowerment to sponsor it. This is why revival is preached. It's important and we must pay attention to it. Blessings, indicators of revival. If I will add one more, when revival begins to happen, churches become full. It's not because our focus is crowd, but crowd is important. You know why? Crowd is important because they are souls. We emphasize the place of discipleship, of training, of people. But we will never negate the place of multitude. Because every multitude you see there is a soul represented. And once upon a time, all of us here were part of the crowd. Before through training and the help of the Holy Ghost, we started coming into the Holy of Holies. We moved from the outer court to the inner court, to the Holy of Holies. That you have made it to the inner court does not mean the outer court is not relevant. So we keep having crowd because souls must be one. The Bible said daily God added to the church. Acts 2, 46 and 47. Such as should be saved. So if revival begins to happen, our churches will grow. Because churches are training centers. Many people will want to be trained so that they can become part of the army of God. Daily, God added to the church. Such as should be saved. In fact, if you study Acts chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, the Bible said, and the number of the disciples began to multiply. So revival brings about multiplication of the number of the disciples. So if we are scanty, we need revival. You know the problem? If they are not in church, they'll be somewhere else. Go to the club, you will find them there. Go to the beer palace, you will find them there. Go to the football stadium, you will find them there. Go to the basketball stadium, you will find them there. So don't assume that, oh, they are not in church, they are not somewhere. They are in many other places. That's why the Anakazo power must come to compare them from the highway to come into the house of God. So when you see people come into the house of God, it's revival at work. Isaiah 2 verse 2, he said, In the last day, the house of the Lord shall be upon the mountains of God. And he said, Men of all nations shall say, Let us go to the house of the Lord. He said, For out of Zion proceeds the Lord. So multitude will come when there is revival. It will come. It will come. We focus more on discipling people, but multitudes are not irrelevant. It's a marker and an indicator that the revival is taking place. Anything you are doing that does not attract the crowd, my brother, it is casting revival. There's a place of discipleship where you deliberately select a few to disciple. Jesus had the 500, he had the 120, he had the 70, he had the 12, he had the 3, he had the 1. There's a place where we separate few people to disciple them. But don't tell us that what you are doing is because it's a serious business. So it's, no. <laughs> you are not sincere to yourself. There's nobody who is burning for God who does not want to see thousands and thousands of people saved daily and sitting to hear the word of God. You are not a sincere person. So we know the place of separating a few to disciple them and we put more pr premium on that. But we also know the necessity of souls being saved on a daily basis and brought to church to be disciples. When it happens like that is revival. Revival draws men to God. Go and look at Jesus' ministry. 
everywhere he went, the multitude followed him. He knew he had the discipline and the focus to separate the disciples from the multitude, but you can never deny the presence of the multitude. It was so with Jesus, it was so with the disciples. Glory to God. It's a marker of revival. A time has come when the people who would rather go to watch a basketball match should come for our services. Whatever it is that gives them satisfaction in those matches, they should have more in God's presence. What is it they pay money for? A music, a, a secular music musician is coming. Before he comes, the stadium is packed and they bought tickets to enter the stadium. Meanwhile, service is free, nobody is coming. What is that thing that appealed to them so much that they will pay money to pack out stadium that they will not come to church to receive? And we say there's revival? No way. The presence of God, there's nothing that compares to the presence of God. He said, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So if there's any pleasure they derive in watching hockey, in watching basketball, or in seeing animals in the zoo, they should have more pleasure coming to church. This is why revival must happen. How can you tell me every Saturday, 100,000 people, 300,000 people sit in a stadium to watch uh, 11 people or 22 people chasing ball in the pitch with joy and they are paying money for it. And when the service, you now see 10 people. And then you tell me it's not about people. What, what are you talking about? Didn't Jesus die for them? If it's not about people, why are we here? Revival attracts multitude. Maturity makes us to separate them and train them according to their levels of growth. But there must be revival. Glory to God. Hallelujah. How do we trigger revival? As I begin to round up. Number one. Is by hunger for the supernatural. Servicing hunger for the supernatural. You will never see revival if you don't desire it. Every generation that saw revival desired it and they hungered for it. There must be a strong desire. Listen, you must desire to see the supernatural in your life. You must desire to see yourself blessed so that you can advance God's kingdom. You must desire to have encounters with God so that you grow in intimacy with God. You must desire to have the power to live righteous. You must desire to be relevant in God's agenda. You must. This is one of the things that the Spirit of God responds to. In Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 4, let me begin from there, verse 29. After they were flogged and beaten and commanded not to preach in the name of Jesus, they didn't go back and said, well, the opposition is so much, let's just rest. God will do his work. They wanted to see God do much more through them until their opposition becomes irrelevant. And so the Bible said they went to their company and they prayed. And they showed us the emphasis of their prayer. In verse 29, it said, Now behold their treadmills. It said, Grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Number two, and by stretching forth thy hand, it said to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child. Immediately they prayed that prayer, verse 31. The Bible said the place where they were was shaking. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to preach with boldness. Verse 33, it said with great power. <laughs> with great power, God gave them witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And great grace was upon them. You cannot see that outpouring and you cannot see that great power except as you desire it. When you see men move in power, they first of all conceived it in their heart. Any man who does not desire it and conceive it in the heart will never see it manifest. Most of us know that God is supposed to use us mightily, but we have never built consciously a strong desire to see God use us. That's why it looks as if God is speaking people all around us and we are not part of those God is speaking. The day your desire becomes strong, that day you attract the attention of the Holy Spirit. You must desire it and desire with all your heart. 
Isaiah, Jeremiah 29 verse 13, he said, if you seek me, and by implication, if you seek any dimension in me, he said, you will have it only when you seek it with the whole of your heart. Some of us have not come to that point where we tell God, Lord, if you don't use me, I won't leave this world. You will use me for your glory because I'm available. Whatever it takes to be used of you, Lord, I'm willing to pay. You have not gotten to that point. That's why you have never seen some of the things that God has put in you. Meanwhile, these things are already installed. It will take desire for you to draw it out. It's not like God is putting a new thing on your inside, necessarily speaking. When Christ was installed in you, glory was installed in you. But it will take desire for you to see that glory. They say Christ in you is the hope of glory. But how much desire do you have? See Christ walk through you. Your belly is filled with fountains, but you can't flood out because there's no desire. Anybody you see operating the powers of revival is one who carries insatiable appetite for the supernatural. God does one today, he's, he's seeking the other one. Ah, deaf ears are opening. You think he has seen something and he's asking himself, how did, the, how did Smith Wigglesworth do it? Ah, you just came from a meeting. Two deaf ears were open. One blind eye open. You should relax for two weeks. God is doing something with you. As he's coming from that meeting, thank you, Father, for what you have done. The next thing he stands up and he's wondering, why didn't that dead person rise? Why didn't the cripple walk? He has thanked God for what God has done, but he knows there's more. And the day the cripple walks, you think he has achieved it. He will say, why is he only one cripple? Why are they not 10? Why are they not 20? The day 10 cripples walk, he say, why don't the whole city get healed? And then you are wondering, you were praying for one, now you are healing 10. And now, you, the desire never ends. The desire keeps growing. It keeps growing. It keeps growing. And the more you open it up, the more God fills you. The more the chambers are filled because the day you become satisfied that day the oil stops so the prophet told the woman ahead of time gather more gather vessels he said gather not a few because god will do to the degree that you desire some of us our desire is too narrow that's why we fell under the anointing and that's the only revival we have experienced for the last 20 years because that's the zenith of our desire oh god has touched me oh when 10 years ago i was in that meeting in 2014 oh and the way god came down 2014 we are in 2024 even mercedes benz have upgraded several times apple has upgraded more than 10 different generations you are still in your version of 240 come on come up here brother come on desire more desire more imagine if you carried iphone 11 Apple has gone far, far. You are in 2014. There's nothing on earth that we are using now that 2014 version is still relevant. Even this microphone, if you see the 2014 version, you will laugh. Even the microphone has upgraded several times. How can you be there, say, in 2014 when God visited me? What are you talking to? The, some people went in to meet God yesterday, tomorrow. Enoch has gone to the rapture. He couldn't wait for the time. He has gone ahead. So there are people who are encountering God in the now. There are people who have already left today and entered tomorrow because of hunger. You think, you don't know. See, some of the things God wants to do tomorrow, there are some men experiencing it now. You are the one who thinks we are all in today. We are not all in today. You may be seated here. There are people who are still living in yesterday. And there are people who are already living in tomorrow. You are the one who thinks we are all in today. It's called today, but we are not all in today. Enoch is already at the rapture. You and I are trusting God for the rapture. That means you can live wherever you want because God is Alpha Omega and in Him we live, in Him we move, in Him we have our being. So if you want to be in the yesterday of God, that's your choice. If you want to be in the today of God, that's your choice. But some of us, we want to be in the tomorrow of God because the Bible said, behind them is a desolate wilderness. It said, but before them is the garden of the Lord. I want to be in the garden of the Lord. Look at the disciples. Jesus himself was laying hands on the sick. Peter said, is this all the dimension there is in you? Is there not something else in you that you have not shown us? And Jesus opened himself. Shadows to heal. And Peter didn't wait for you and I. 
they started manifesting it. I doubt if that dimension was for their generation. Because the one Jesus showed their generation was laying on of hands. But they went into dimension that was for futuristic generation. And they started, it's just like using AI in 2019. <laughs> or using AI in 1980. AI is not meant for 1980. It's meant for 2024. And we, we who are supposed to live in 2024 have not come. Somebody has hacked into the system in 1980 and is already using it. And then there are people who are in 2024. They have still not learned AI. They will give them, they say, please, I'm not part of that thing. You will be left behind. Though. That's how it's in the spirit. People are bilocating. People are sitting in their room receiving full blueprint. Of, 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 of structures, of architectural structures. People are receiving business plan sitting in their room. And you, you are still there waiting that if God is willing, he will send somebody. If you don't desire, you will be left behind. You will be left behind. This is a generation where people are building companies online. You are there saying, why is it so hard to get a job? Begin to see yourself as a CEO. Begin to see yourself as an owner of a business. And they ask you, how shall these things be? Tell yourself, the Holy Ghost shall come upon me. The power of the higher shall overshadow me. They ask you, how shall these things be? Tell them, as thou knowest not how the bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child. So also knoweth not thou the ways of the spirit. There are many answers to her. You just believe. You just desire. And see God go to work. Is born by men who desire. It was told of Evangelists. He comes to church and he sits down and cries for two hours. They didn't know why. Ah, your church is full. Why are you crying? The guy was seeing the whole of Wales delivered. Meanwhile, somebody has, has uh, 30 members. He's dressed in tuxedo suit. He's now the bishop of the city. He has color. He has long uh, chain. Crucifix is bigger than my hand. <laughs> I'm not saying don't thank God for little beginning. I appreciate God. But if that is your, you are satisfied. <laughs> you went for crusade. The five testimonies that came out, three of them is back pain. And one other person said, well, I had long shoulder, but it has been released. Thank God for it. But if you are satisfied, will be left behind. You will be left be when people are telling eyes sockets that don't have eyeballs for eye to grow out of it. And it's happening. You, you are already satisfied because somebody say I had pain, but it's like it's like the pain is gone. You say, yeah, the pain is gone. <laughs> my brother, my brother, wake up, wake, wake up, wake up, wake up. You come for deliverance service. One person just fell down. You heard sound of chair. You say, all the demons are out. They are not fell down. Let's check. Let me show. Please, don't despise the little beginning. But don't be satisfied too quick. Sometimes you hear people talk about the mighty things they are doing. And you are wondering, is this what you call mighty? So you have already arrived. If this is mighty, then you don't know what mighty is. Because desire for you know why the things that were written were written is to help our expectations. The Bible said in Romans 15, verse 4, he said the things that were written at four times, he said they were written for our memory. So that we having the patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. If in the days of Jesus, where he didn't have all of the publicity stories that we have today, he didn't have all of the enablements of microphones and amplifiers. Jesus was addressing 5,000 men. How can I be satisfied that I have 200 men? How can I be satisfied that I have 1,000 people? Jesus has raised the bar already. That means the least force should address more than 5,000 men. That's the bar he raised. If in the days of Jesus, where he had to trick, trek for days to enter one city. The Bible said he entered every village and every city that was in his region. How can I be in Australia? And I have not gone to every city in Australia to preach. When I have aeroplanes to carry me, Jesus was trekking and riding on horses and donkeys. 
And the Bible said he went to every village and every city. You, you are here, you are already being called apostle. And you have not taught half of the cities in Australia. And you think you have achieved something. Jesus already raised the bar. That means any country you find yourself, every nook and cranny, you should enter there and preach the gospel. That's what desire does. And as your desire grows, the power required to fill up that desire is released. That's how it works. Build desire. Don't let anything deplete your desire. Build it, build it, build it. Is the, is the channel through which power will flow through your life. Second provoker of revival is repentance and brokenness. If there's anything in you that is not of God, you must turn away from it. And when you turn away from it, you must humble yourself before the Lord and ask Him to take it away. Listen, don't cover things up. You can package for men, not for spirits. You can come among men and act as if all is well, not for spirits. If there is lust in you, you must turn away from it and ask the Father, take it away from me. And you must stay there until God removes it. Don't leave the, the debris and the garbages of your life and be preaching to others. Paul said it's possible to preach to others and you will be cast away. You are lukewarm. You cannot pray. Ask God to help you. Don't come out of your prayerlessness and start telling people how prayer is important. It's delusion. Revival can't come out of it. You must first of all become to be able to produce it. You must become. This is why anybody who God be used to provoke genuine revival is, must be a man of repentance and a man of brokenness. Anything he discovers God is not happy with, he turns from it. And if he turns, he humbles himself and asks for help. The Bible said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, he said, my people who are called by my name. So he's not talking about strangers. He said, they will humble themselves and turn from wicked ways. He said, I will hear them and I will come down and heal their lands. You know the problem with us? We think revival is about talking. Meanwhile, we have not checked. So people are dressed on garbage, trying to create a system that can handle the glory of God. And the devil looks at us and laughs. These are jokers. You are struggling with fornication. And then you are coming to tell people about the spiritual holiness. You must turn away first. Humble yourself and ask God to help you. You are coming to preach and your focus is how you can take money from people. And you are telling them God wants to raise people. You are, you are a joker. You are a joker. Your convictions and your intentions have already been weighed in the balances. Because in the spirit realm, your intention is louder than your voice. Your motive is stronger than your action. So when you show up, the spirits will weigh you first. Before they can put authority and credibility on what you say. This is why if it's revival we are looking for, we must become honest with ourselves. Lord, I'm too proud. I stood on that altar and I wanted to show them that I was special. I never preached a message. Help me. And the Holy Ghost will carry you through a process. A process of chastening until he makes that vessel that has passed through the fire so that you can host the fire for your generation. He said, repent. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 verse 19. And he said, times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Everybody who bears the mark of revival and everybody who provokes revival know the significance of repentance and brokenness. We are too full of ourselves for God to take the risk of entrusting us with power. You know what will happen in this generation if we send handkerchiefs and demons are cast out? Do you know what will happen in this generation if we send handkerchiefs and cripples walk? We will start first of all handkerchief company. And every handkerchief will be worth $10,000. Everyone. Every handkerchief, there will be a price tag. And it will no longer be about Christ. It will become a business venture. And then the man of God will, be, will make sure there is CCTV everywhere to count every piece. Because he is first of all a thief. And all his workers will be thieves. And we will monitor how many handkerchiefs. In fact, we will put three seals on the handkerchief. There will be the the seal from the company, the second seal from your wife, then the third seal is the one that 
you will put your step. That one will be manual. So that it can be copied. And if they don't, you will announce it 20 times. If you don't see the third C, don't buy. It means it's... <laughs> Uh, you are reading, it's God, these special miracles by Paul. Handkerchiefs were taken from him. If handkerchiefs start coming from us, do you know the price tags that we put on it? Imagine if your shadow starts healing the sick. Before you see man of God, you must pay $30,000. Man of God will have four secretaries. Even the secretaries, before you see them, you wait for appointment. So you meet fourth secretary and book appointment with $1,000. You meet second secretary and book appointment with $3,000. You meet third secretary and book appointment with $5,000. You meet the fourth secretary. That time you have already spent like $15,000. Then when you are coming to the man of God, you will first of all pass through an empty office to prepare yourself. By the time you reach the office of the man of God, he won't look at you first. He will stand and be watching the wall. Because he's, he's in, the, in this third heaven. When you come and he doesn't turn like that, you will first of all kneel down and put yourself in order. When, when man of God now turns and brings heaven your way. <laughs> Meanwhile, secretary has already programmed you that make sure, make sure before you talk, you keep your seat at the feet of the apostle. They have programmed you. Why? Because the shadow of man of God can solve your problem. Man of God may look at you and he's walking around. And you now put your seat, you look at it. If you, if you understand honor and if you qualify for the graces that you are supposed to carry, Are not qualified that one there's a measure of grace that's the one that can serve you bro. if you now if you go to the level of talking that means you did some things you will now say it is well <laughs> but when the secretary is briefing that this one did well as you come he will smile give me a hug and the man of God will hug you and give you an experience of a lifetime. You think God is not wise? Is this a generation that handkerchiefs will cast out devils? Is this a generation where the shadow of men will heal the sick? You think God is not wise? We will plunder the house of God. And so there are powers that God cannot allow for our generation. This is why, although we read it in the Bible, we know it is true, but very few can see it. Because these are wolves in sheep clothing. These are hirelings. They are not sons of God. In my country now, they say all kinds of soap in the church. All kinds of soap, I will say. All kinds of soap. Soap that brings wealth. Soap that brings favor. Soap. That... <laughs> and people queue up. Queue up to buy soap. People queue up. They fight. People who have Bibles, they never read. They fight to buy soap. A man of God will go to the mountain for three days. He's going to bring soap from heaven. Soap. And he will, when he comes with the soap, the first 50 soap, that one is for special people. So people will even queue up to be part of the special people. What a generation. And we say we want to see dimensions. If revival will happen, there will be two repentance and brokenness. Number three, provoker of revival is prayer and consistent seeking of the Lord. Go and read your Bible. They told us in church history that they waited for 10 days in the upper room before the Holy Ghost descended. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. That was not when the thing happened. They were seeking God in prayer consistently. And the Bible said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, he said they were still together in one accord. They were still in the place of seeking. And the Bible said, and suddenly there came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And when that sound came, it came with the fire. And cloaking tongues as of fire was upon their heads. If we can't wait on God, we can't see revival. I know we are on a speedy lane in our generation, but the spirit train doesn't operate like that. God is a king. That you have fast food, fast cars, fast planes, does not mean God has become fast God. 
you must wait and seek him and seek him with the whole of your heart if it's revival you are looking for i was telling my my friends and i told them this conference we just came to trouble the waters if we want to do revival we may need to at least begin with 14 days where we'll come and sit with god hear the word of god for five six hours pray for two three hours and continue hitting like that for if something we hope because some of us where our soup is <laughs> the routine of this environment where it has put our soul <laughs> it may take 10 days first for, for for our soul to feel the presence of god it will take 10 days where the soul is you may need to pray for four days to feel that you are praying the, the first four days as you are praying your spirit is wandering about your spirit your soul is wandering because by reason of wake up early, walk the night, and walk even weekend for to take two, three shifts to meet up bills. It's been long. Your soul heard the sounds and the echoes of eternity. <laughs> so the soul has been pocketed deep in the in the in the in the, in the recesses of the mind. You know, God will have to take time to draw you out. To draw you. So you will keep hearing the word. You'll be hearing. It's after 12 days that your spirit will, will wake up. After hearing for 12 days and praying, praying. The first five days you were praying, your knee was paining you. You stood for, for 30 minutes, say, Kai, let's sit somewhere. <laughs> you, you were not ascending. You had to find a seat. To, it's on the 12th day that you now sense the spirit of prayer. And then instead of feeling pain, you discover the more you pay, the more you are activated. And the point comes, you who was praying and dozing off, you start praying and you start jumping. And you start moving and something a spirit has mantled you that's when you came alive but in three days you have not the turbine has not actually have not woken up they still trying to start but if in survival we are looking for there must be a place where we pray look at the early church they called it the time of prayer that means everything they did stopped at that hour for men to ventilate their spirit so the thing didn't happen by chance they were deliberate about it on the altar he said the fire on the altar must not be put out leviticus 6 12 and 13 he said the priest must put wood on it every morning every morning carriers of revival are people who keep staring and staring they fan to flame the gift of god that is upon them they fan it you want to see the fire you must fan it he said in 2 Timothy 1 6, this commandment I give unto you, O my son Timothy, that you fan to flame the gift of God that is in you. It may have come, but the embers can't kindle, except as you trouble it on the altar. You trouble it. Everybody you see revive is a troubler of the altar. He sits there and he keeps tearing the turbine until a point comes when there's an eruption of the spirit. That's how revival happens. They are triggered. They are triggered. They are triggered. They are triggered. And then finally, because of our time, you want to see revival, you must preach the word consistently. You preach the word. The word carries the textures of fire that illuminates the soul. You preach the word. It's the word that activates men. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, he said, When Peter preached and they heard, he said they were caught in their hearts. And they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? If the word is not preached, there will be no revival. We preach revival. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, when he preached in Nineveh and they heard him, the king tore his garment and revival began. Everywhere you see revival, preachers of righteousness emerge. In 2 Kings 22, verse 8 to 11, they found the word of the Lord and the Bible said they read it. The moment the king heard it, Hezekiah tore his garment. When people hear the word of truth, it stirs their spirits. This is why revival does not happen where the word of God is not preached and the word of God is not respected. If we want to see revival, we must keep bombarding the word. Keep preaching it. Listen, at first you'll be preaching, people will be sleeping. Don't stop. The Bible says, why men slept? The enemy came and planted. So Satan plants when men sleep. God too plants when people are sleeping. If they are sleeping, be preaching. Their spirits are awake. 
and the time will come their spirit will hear and hear until the spirit will become energized and the power of the spirit will overpower the power of the body and then you will see that revival will begin preach it second chronicles 34 verse 18 to 19 revivals happen when the word is preached we preach it we preach it we preach it we preach it he said, Hilka the priest had given me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. He just read it and see what happened in verse 19. He just read the book of the Lord. Go to verse 19. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the Lord, he read his book. When you talk the word, when you preach the word, when you release the word, you give the Holy Ghost room for operation. You know why? The Holy Ghost did not come to bear witness to you first. He came to bear witness to the world. That's why the Holy Ghost wants to move, but he's powerless where the world is not preached. As you start preaching the world, you give the Holy Ghost room for expression. And the more you preach it, the more empowered the Holy Ghost becomes. This is how revival is stirred among people. You want to see revival? There must be hunger for the supernatural. You want to see revival? There must be true repentance and brokenness. See, we are too conscious of what people will say. So somebody falls into fornication. Instead of coming back to be rehabilitated, we are first of all trying to manage his reputation. And we manage people's reputation into becoming wolves in sheep clothing. Somebody is involved in fraud. Instead of coming back to an accountability group and saying, I'm there, and he stops whatever he's doing to be rehabilitated, they manage him and say, There's a mistake. Go like this, go like this. After two weeks, go back and forth. We need you there. We need you there. And then the conscience is seared. After a while, it becomes his lifestyle. And then the danger is that the people he preaches to, they will also become fraudulent. The people they fornicate or preaches to, they also become fornicators. Because it's beyond what you are hearing. Wars transfer spirits. They say the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's why some of you, you were listening to people that you thought they were on fire, you now dozed off. The 20 minutes that you dozed off, you now found yourself in immorality. And you are wondering, this person is preaching about angels. What am I, what am I doing here? You are now interacting with the reality of that person. <laughs> the realm does not lie. This is who the person is. In the natural, he has the lingo, but in the spirit, that is his reality. Paul said, we are desirous of you. So we did not just preach to you the gospel, but the very substance of our soul. So you are listening to somebody, you are not born in. You listen to him, you are struggling with something. You come around him, you are struggling with something. He, he gives you an idea of who he is in the spirit. That's a wolf in sheep clothing. And it's through packaging and trying to manage things that we should come under the Holy Ghost to deal with, that men become like that. And you see that genuine people who were seeking God, they, come, they came under the radar of corrupt people. And they became fraudulent just by sitting under some people. Genuine brokenness, genuine repentance. And then prayer, genuine prayer to seek God. And then finally, preaching of the word of truth. Where people preach the word with a pure heart. Not because they want to impress you. Not because they want to take anything from you. They are just telling you God's standard the way it is. If you hear such things over time, the fire will erupt on your inside. And you will see revival. And when such revivals come, they are usually heavy. Glory to God. They are usually heavy. Nothing stops such revival. Those are the kinds of revival that gives God his place among people. And those are the kinds of revival that stops the agenda of Satan in the lives of people and in territories where the influence of those revivals are allowed. And we pray in the Holy Ghost. I was deliberate to take time to instruct you before I, op I open my spirit so that you will hear it and write it. Unlike the first two days, I want you to write these things. Know them, study them, follow them. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey ya hey ya hey ya hey 
I want us to pray and things will happen here in a moment. But I want to be sure these chairs, it looks quite high. <laughs> Do we have ushers here to manage what we want to trust God for? I don't want somebody to fall on top of this altar. <laughs> are, we, are we able to manage ourselves here? I need to be sure. Now please hear this. In this service, there will be awakenings. There will be awakenings. I'm telling you. Some of you who carry ancient dimensions, ancient, ancient mantles, ancient graces, you connect to ancient spiritual lineages. There will be awakenings of those order. There will be awakenings. There will be awakenings here tonight. Can we pray in the Holy Ghost? Can we pray in the Holy Ghost? Great expectation. Yeah. 
Ayala, Ereketima, Ebedikaisha, Elimina, Elimina. Can we lift our hands toward heaven? Some of you carry prophetic mantles that have become dormant. Some of you carry apostolic graces that have become dormant. But God is in need of men. Some of you carry leadership and governmental mantles that are blunt and not yet finding expression. The reason God brought you here is because he wants to stir it up. He wants an awakening. Can we lower the volume? Can we lift those hands toward heaven? Let's lower the volume a little. Lower the volume a little. There are three things I'll do here this evening. And the first is to ask God for an awakening. So that graces and dimensions that God has installed on our lives will begin to find expression from this season. Let's just lift those hands. I wouldn't want to be aggressive tonight because I'm not comfortable with this auditorium. Father, this is the hour for the appointment, for the awakening, and for the commissioning of sons. This is the hour. Lord, these ones have come because they are willing to be used of your spirit in this season. And so I ask everyone that carries a grace as a witness, as a custodian, everyone that carries a mantle, everyone that carries a dimension, everyone that is called as a witness of the last day, I come to them as one sent of God. In the name of Jesus, let that mantle, let that grace, let that dimension, let it receive an awakening now. Touch! Usher, accept them. <laughs>